What comes to mind when you hear the term private equity? Is it big groups like KKR, Carlyle, or Blackstone? Is it failed deals or misrun companies that were run into the ground after private equity purchased them? Well, regardless of what your perception of private equity is, and I'm not going to try to change that today, different PE groups and different sectors within PE have different appetites. Understanding the type of private equity investor that would be interested in your company can drastically change and improve the outcome for you as the seller. Hi, I am Nick McLean with Four Pillars Investors. This is the latest section from my ebook, How to Sell Your Business to Private Equity. Stay tuned and here are some thoughts from me as to what you can do as a business owner to be more effective in your interactions with private equity and ultimately, potentially, increase the value that you get for your company. On the whole, PE offers a promising avenue for owners seeking an exit, but understanding the current market with its diverse players and shifting dynamics is crucial for maximizing the success of your sale. Dry powder deluge. First, the PE sector is currently sitting on record levels of capital, and it has been like that for a while. PE funds are overflowing with unspent capital, estimated at an eye-watering $6 trillion globally. This translates to fierce competition for attractive acquisition targets, potentially driving up the sale price of your business. This isn't a monolith of capital, though. Venture capital, growth equity, and buyout funds each have their own sweet spots in terms of business size and stage. Matching your business's profile to the right pool can attract more relevant and serious buyers. In PE, the traditional favorites still shine. Healthcare, technology, and business services remain strong magnets for PE dollars. Businesses in these sectors can leverage their inherent resilience and growth potential to attract suitors. But there are a number of emerging themes and niche players gaining new attention. Sustainability, automation, and home services are rising stars capturing the attention of investors. Don't shy away from showcasing your niche expertise within larger sectors. It can set you apart. And don't forget PE's interest in distressed opportunities. While economic uncertainties loom, some sectors like retail and hospitality might face challenges. If your business navigates these headwinds successfully, even though it is still impacted, it could become an attractive turnaround play for opportunistic investors. PE often gravitates toward recurring revenue business models, in part because those cash flows are perceived to be less risky and more stable for investors and more likely to scale with a capital injection. The counter is also true, that companies with variable cash flows are less valuable. We've seen this in the industry's interest in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning HVAC companies in recent years. This has been partly due to the fact that the increased prevalence of and reliance on service contracts is helping to make HVAC revenue more recurring in nature. It's a similar story with car washes. They used to be unattractive due to their dependence on weather and thus the general difficulty of projecting revenues. Once the monthly subscription was introduced, however, the game changed. Another financial metric the PE looks for is the relationship between EBITDA and operating cash flow or free cash flow. Asset intensive businesses typically require meaningful annual or at least somewhat recurring capital expenditures or CapEx. With higher CapEx, the ratio of cash flow to EBITDA will be lower. At the end of the day, buyers want more cash flow, so anything that impacts cash flow will likely have an impact on what multiple of EBITDA the buyer is willing to pay. Additionally, the expectation is that future growth will require incremental CapEx. That isn't hugely negative, but it is certainly better if growth can be achieved without the need for CapEx. While I will discuss later the concepts and ideas you can use to increase the attractiveness of your company to a buyer, there are a few high-level considerations I would like to bring up here. Prove your commitment. As mentioned earlier, it is important to show a buyer that you are committed to the process. This is slightly less of an issue if you've decided to use a sell-side advisor, but it still matters. Most folks in PE look at hundreds, if not thousands of deals in a given year. One quick way to get someone to stop looking at your deal or to lower its priority on their list is to make them think that you're just kicking tires. A later section, the marketing pack, gives actionable advice on how to prove that you mean business. 
Data-driven insights. Use data to strengthen the attractiveness of your company. While some folks just think of analyzing numbers when they hear a topic like this, there are actually a few levers that you can pull. Unleash the power of numbers. Investors are data hungry, and quantifiable evidence can significantly boost your credibility and valuation. But keep in mind that developing data-driven insights is not easy, especially for business owners that operate based on gut feelings. As an investor, I always perk up when I hear about business owners making moves for quantifiable reasons, as opposed to just lucking into a certain customer or sector. Competitive intelligence is key. Analyze your competitor's performance, customer base, and product service offerings. Understanding the market landscape allows you to benchmark your position and tailor your pitch accordingly. Beyond financials, tell the story. While numbers are important, don't underestimate the power of narrative. Weave the data into a compelling story that highlights your unique value proposition, competitive edge, and future potential. The main takeaway here is that as a seller, you can't simply say that you're the best, that your customers love you, and have it taken as truth. You need to be able to support your arguments. And I use the word arguments intentionally, quantitatively, in order for PE or any other sophisticated buyer to value your business higher. We all know the importance of the internal team. It's helpful to think about the external team as well. Find your champions. Team up with experienced deal attorneys and or accountants who specialize in M&A and understand the nuances of the PE landscape. Their expertise can help you navigate the complexities of deal negotiations, valuations, and due diligence. Synergy through collaboration. Leverage partnerships with industry experts, consultants, or even potential co-sellers. Combining your strengths and expertise can increase your attractiveness to investors and potentially secure a premium valuation. Consider joining a CEO peer group. It can be extremely helpful to have a forum where you can discuss the trials and tribulations of going through a sale process. What I found with my partner is that all I need to do is outline the issue to him and then, through the process of voicing my thoughts out loud, the appropriate course of action becomes apparent. A business shouldn't be viewed simply as a collection of different activities or people or equipment. The business needs to be presented and thus viewed as a machine with many moving parts all working together. Here are some approaches to help achieve that. Don't wait, prepare. Don't approach your exit strategy as a last minute scramble. Develop a well-defined plan years in advance that outlines your timeline, valuation expectations, and preferred deal structure. This demonstrates your professionalism and preparedness to potential buyers. Know your worth. It is helpful to have realistic expectations regarding value. Some M&A professionals will try to convince a business owner that their business is worth more. But just remember, at the end of the day, your business is worth only as much as a buyer is willing to pay. Flexibility is key. While having a clear vision is crucial, be prepared to adapt your exit strategy based on market conditions and buyer interest. Openness to alternative structures such as stage exits or joint ventures, can broaden your reach and increase your chances of success. Put together a package, get organized and collect your marketing deck, financial package, and other assets in one place so it is easy for buyers to review them. Though much of this guide has focused on what you can do as a seller to increase the value and or attractiveness of your business, getting to know the potential buyer is important as well. If this really is thought to be a partnership, the buyer should be reciprocating the effort to build a relationship. What does this look like? What are the red flags? I have some thoughts here, but at the end of the day, you likely have been working with people for as long or longer than me and thus developed your own methods. This is another area in which it could be helpful to participate in a CEO peer group. Another winning strategy, in my experience, is to think of your business as a used car, your used car that you are actually trying to sell. In all likelihood, you would be able to sell it for the blue book value quite easily, or perhaps you might go the simplest route, take it to a dealership and accept whatever they offer you. But what if you were trying to sell to a third party? Having driven the car over a period of years, you know the ins and outs. You know what is working perfectly and what seems to have some issues. You know how regimented you've been about periodic service. Finally, you have your feeling for how reliable the vehicle has been. Potential buyers will be skeptical of whatever you tell them. We've all heard stories of people essentially getting scammed and buying a clunker. If you just tell them how great the car is, will that matter? If you tell them that all of the scheduled maintenance was performed on time, will they believe that? Getting back to the example, I think the situation would be different if you kept a folder containing all of your service receipts. It might help to proactively order a Carfax report or something similar. Another idea would be to, to go to an independent car shop and have them 
perform a pre-purchase inspection. Perhaps I'm a pushover, but if a folder was presented to me containing all that information, I would have much more confidence that I was buying a vehicle that someone took good care of. Now draw a parallel to your business. Your customers say that no other competitors can match your quality? We'll find a way to show that in hard evidence. Back up your claim that the business is very steady by showing a few years of consistent revenue and earnings growth. If there are certain troubles in the business, you should be the one to point them out. Then provide a detailed explanation of how the company got in this situation and how you plan to get out of it. People are skeptical of buying used cars and of buying businesses. Accept this and address it head on. However, in every deal, buyers and sellers will try to outmaneuver each other, both jostling to get the most value for the business and or pay the least for it. It's just the nature of things. That said, there are some approaches to deal making that work better than others. Among the deal killers that I've seen over the years are playing hard to get, letting performance drop off post LOI, waiting for the diligence to uncover tax and other liabilities instead of being upfront about them early on, creative accounting, and hiring inexperienced, lazy, or incompetent advisors. Let's take a look at these in more detail. Playing hard to get. I have often heard sellers say something to the effect of, I'm not really interested in selling. Sometimes that is true, or at least partly so. But what I ask myself is if they weren't really interested in selling, why did they agree to meet with me? Or I hear sellers talk about wanting to be healthy enough to actually enjoy their retirement, and who knows how long their health will last, then five minutes later, say they're perfectly fine holding on to the business for many years to come. For the seller, it can be difficult. The desire to exit might be strong on some days, while on others, the desire to keep working might be strong. How can the seller effectively communicate their desires? My suggestion is to put more, though perhaps not all, of your cards on the table. Tell your prospective buyer that you are not interested in selling today, but that you are trying to build relationships with prospective buyers and want to stay in touch over the coming weeks, months, and or years so they can see firsthand all the great things your business is doing. The idea here is that you are building trust without losing negotiating power. The approach outlined above accomplishes that. Be careful what you tell the prospective buyer though. I would shy away from talking about growth percentages, landing a new customer soon, or anything easily measurable because if you don't achieve what you discuss, your credibility will be hurt at least to some degree. While the risk of this one happening comes a bit later in the process, it is very important. Far and away, the number one thing you can do to lose a deal is let performance drop off after the LOI has been signed and during due diligence. It is almost as bad if performance drops off after the term sheet or indication of interest stage. This might not completely resolve the issue, but at the very least, let the prospective buyer know as soon as possible if revenue and or earnings are likely to fall. You need to be the one to tell them. Don't let them uncover it on their own after reviewing the latest financials. I've heard from some sellers and sell-side advisors that after all the diligence, the buyer should know what assets they're buying and a little dip in performance shouldn't matter. Well, I'm here to call BS on that. Yes, we know what assets we're buying, but at the end of the day, we're buying cash flow. Declining performance just opens up all sorts of different cans of worms. So please take this topic to heart. Another way to lose a deal is for the buyer to uncover potential tax or other liabilities during the diligence process. That you have potential off-balance sheet liabilities is not a deal killer in itself, but you should make the buyer aware of them early on, and you will need to address them. If the liabilities are substantial, then one option would be to escrow some portion of the sale proceeds. However, this could drastically reduce your cash proceeds. My advice is to get these issues out and open early in the discussions. Here is an example based on an actual deal that we were working on. We were very excited about the company and had been in talks for quite a while. The purchase price and the structure were agreed to, but then the seller wanted a stock purchase. Ordinarily, that probably could have been worked out. However, in this case, the seller was a C-Corp. While that's also fine, what wasn't fine is that the seller was running millions of dollars annually of personal expenses through the business. He hadn't gotten caught yet. If we'd bought the business and he or the company had been audited and found guilty of underpaying taxes, then as the owner of a C corporation stock, we would have been jointly liable for the underpaid taxes as well as any penalties and interest. The seller was unwilling to waver on this point, so we had to walk away. 
As we will discuss later, a formal quality of earnings QOV, analysis will be needed. If your financials are not reported consistently with generally accepted accounting principles GAAP, there could be issues. Having your financial statements audited is one way to help ensure you, that your belief about what your earnings are is consistent with what a future buyer is likely to think they are. Is a QOV really needed? I could share countless examples here to prove that you need a QOV, but I'll limit myself to just one. An acquisition target was reporting, let's say, 5 million in EBITDA. Margins were great. However, once the QOV started looking into revenue recognition, they realized that the sellers had been misrepresenting revenue. The reported revenue assumed that the business's customers would renew contracts based on historical trends. Spotting this reduced EBITDA by almost 75%. Just to be clear, it is not okay to report revenue based on the fact that you think your customers will renew. I hate to talk disparagingly about folks, but I have worked on deals where the sell side advisor was the principal reason, without a doubt, why the deal didn't get done. Why? See below for five reasons we have encountered, of many. One, inaccurate financial reporting. A sell side advisor thought it would be acceptable to estimate the amount of SGNA because he, quote unquote, knew the industry and therefore had a feel for what SGNA should be. The actuals did not match the advisor's estimates. Shocker, the actuals were higher. This almost killed the deal, though we were able to keep it on the rails, partly because the seller didn't know his advisor had done that. Two, running a middle market deal like it's an SMB or a Main Street deal. Whether the advisor and or the seller likes it or not, if your company has over $2 million in EBITDA, buyers will expect it to be treated as a middle market deal. On some deals this large, I've seen advisors using sellers, discretionary earnings instead of EBITDA, plus excluding working capital. Because of this, the seller's valuation expectations were way off. Three, unprofessional and inadequate marketing materials. We've seen SIMS, confidential information memorandums, that are lacking so much information, they're only slightly better than being completely useless. I understand that not all sell side advisors enjoy putting together PowerPoint presentations or similar documents, but many buyers will pass on a deal if the SIM doesn't provide the information that they need. Four, lack of basic financial knowledge. I've heard some sell side advisors inaccurately report revenues and others add back capitalized expenses to EBITDA. On one deal, the sell side advisor added $5 million of CapEx back to get income to EBITDA of approximately $8 million. Needless to say, we couldn't agree on evaluation. I honestly believe that the seller believed this was permissible, but the sell side advisor should have caught this. 5. Blowing off important issues. There have been many times when the sell side advisor has failed to appreciate the magnitude of certain issues. For example, we were working with a seller that had maybe eight to 12 people working for him that the seller was compensating as 1099 contractors. The sell side advisor just blew it off, saying that it was permissible for some reason that was inconsistent with IRS rules. He maintained his belief that it wasn't a big deal and encouraged his client to do the same. A fair question to ask then is would these deals have gone differently without a sell side advisor? In some cases, absolutely yes. In some of these situations we discussed with the sellers directly, and their fallback was that they trusted their advisor, which harmed the deal. I talked earlier about how smart people make bad decisions when it comes to selecting a sell side advisor. It's unfortunate, but it's a real risk to sellers who choose to go this path. Key takeaways. One, PE can bring a lot to the table for the right business owner, from expertise to connections and more. If you aren't selling 100% of your business or you plan to stay on post-close, these can be significant advantages. Two but you have to prove your commitment to the process. If you aren't ready to sell, that is perfectly fine. Just be upfront about it. Many PE buyers will appreciate your proactive approach. Three, not every deal goes as expected. And there are some well-known deal killers that can come up and derail deals for even the best of companies. So there you have it. My advice on what you can do to help set yourself and your business up for a great outcome from private equity buyer. Now, obviously there is much more that you need to do. I can only cover really the, the tip of the iceberg 
in a 15 to 20 minute video, but at the very least, I hope it got you to thinking about some of the issues that buyers will think about and also some of the issues that you as the seller should think about proactively as you start heading down this process. Stay tuned to the channel as there will be numerous other videos, not just from the ebook, but also on topics such as how to value your business, how to maintain control of your business, that all will be very important and useful to you as a business owner as you start going down the process of selling your business, whether it's to private equity or to someone else. Let me know what you think though. I try to make these videos so that they're new, not too complex, but also not that they're so high level that there's no value that the viewer gets out of them. Have I achieved my goals or do I need some work? Let me know in the comments. And as always, if you'd like to talk with me one-on-one, -on -one, there's a link in the comments section to my calendar. Book some time and I'd love to talk with you. Thanks for watching.